So this is folate, or the deprotonated form of folic acid, also known as vitamin B9. Folate is typically made by plants and fungi, and can be derived from a variety of foods. The structure includes this pteridine ring, para-aminobenzoic acid, and a polyglutamate chain. The number of glutamates varies between 1 and 6 to 9, and actually varies during the absorption process. We're going to abbreviate that half of the structure with the letter R for simplicity. A useful thing about folate is this aromatic nitrogen containing ring structure that can vary its oxidation state. You might recognize that it's similar to the coenzymes NAD plus and FAD. In the same fashion, it's possible to reduce the molecule to, and add hydrogens using the enzyme dihydrofolate reductase. It can then be reduced further by the same enzyme to tetrahydrofolate, which is the fully activated form of vitamin B9. So what does tetrahydrofolate do? It's the central molecule for a system known as one carbon metabolism. You might remember acetyl-CoA and ketogenesis pathways that deals with two carbon metab metabolism. You can even make huge molecules like fatty acids, two carbons at a time. So this is dealing with when you need, need to add a methyl group or individual carbon to complete a ring structure. Folate contains one carbon structures in a variety of oxidation states using its ring structure and the nitrogen containing chain. I've numbered the structural atoms in blue to keep track of some of the names, but you'll only really have to focus on the numbers five and 10. So we had acetate or acetyl before. Now we have formate, which is the base of formic acid. If you add formate to the N10 position, you get N10 formal tetrahydrofolate, which is the one carbon attached as an aldehyde group to the N10. Right away, we can see a function of the folate molecules because N10 formal tetrahydrofolate is needed for two reactions in the generation of the purine ring structures for the bases adenine and guanine. So we start with a five ribose 5-phosphate sugar, and then we get a nitrogen from glutamine, and then we add an entire glycine structure, and then we have our first folate reaction. It donates the formal group to complete the five-membered ring and goes back to tetrahydrofolate. After that, we have another, another nitrogen from glutamine, and then one more single carbon this time from CO2, so we know that this was a biotin-dependent reaction. Then we have another nitrogen, this time from aspartate. And finally, we have our second folate reaction, where we need another formal group to complete the ring. By this stage, it's generated inositol monophosphate from the purine nucleotide cycle, which can be further modified into ADP and GDP and then ATP and GTP, which can be used in RNA synthesis or other cellular functions. They can be also converted to deoxy ATP and GTP, which can be used in DNA synthesis. So that's formal. The folate can also be converted to an intermediate methanol form. And you can see there's a bridge between the N5 and N10. And this can be further reduced to methylene, which is the same structure with an additional hydrogen and only a single bond. This is an extremely important molecule that we'll come back to shortly. Although so far, we've only discussed single carbons coming from formate. There's actually a shortcut directly between tetrahydrofolate and the methylene form using serine hydroxymethyltransferase. This is a reaction that requires vitamin B6 as PLP, and it converts serine to glycine using the serine as a single carbon donor. You can also achieve the same reaction with glycine itself using the glycine cleavage system. This takes a carbon from glycine and converts the rest to CO2 and ammonium. Now we're at methylene tetrahydrofolate, we can do another very important donation via Thymidylate synthase, which adds a carbon group to deoxyuracil monophosphate to make deoxythymidine monophosphate, which is the equivalent base to uracil in DNA. 
Without this function, the cell can't make thymidine and might use uracil instead, which needs to be repaired and can cause DNA damage. You might notice that this reaction doesn't return tetrahydrofolate. Instead, it returns the partially oxidized form dihydrofolate. This needs to be converted back to tetrahydrofolate before it can be useful again. There's one more clinically relevant form of tetrahydrofolate, which is 5-methyl tetrahydrofolate. This is the most reduced and most stable form. It's special because it can't be used directly to perform methylation. Instead, the me universal methyl donor is a molecule called s adenosyl methionine, also known as SAM, and it gets its carbon group from 5-methyl tetrahydrofolate using vitamin B12. So vitamin, vitamin B12 is also known as cobalamin. It's the most complex vitamin molecule and it contains a cobalt ion, which is one of our essential trace minerals. B12 is made by bacteria, but in our diet, the only source is animal products and some fortified foods. If you see an R group there on the molecule attached to the cobalt ion, the R can substitute for a methyl group or a deoxy adenosyl group in vivo. Other supplemental forms include hydroxycobalamin and cyanocobalamin, but with hydroxy or cyanide groups as the R structure, respectively. These are used as supplements. The first and most important role of B12 is as a cofactor attached to the enzyme methionine synthase, which exists as in the cytosol and uses the methyl form. B12 donates its methyl structure group to homocysteine, converting it to methionine. At this point, the cobalt ion changes to an unstable plus one oxidation state and rapidly accepts a replacement methyl group for the, from the N5-methyl tetrahydrofolate, converting it back to tetrahydrofolate. Methionine can then be converted to to SAM, which is the universal methylation donor. SAM provides the methyl group for numerous recipients, shown here as R, and in the process, it is converted to s adenosyl homocysteine, which is known as SAH. These reactions include numerous important functions, such as the synthesis of adrenaline from noradrenaline, melatonin, phosphatidylcholine, and creatine. It also includes all of DNA methylation, which is one of the primary epigenetic modifications, as well as the methylation of myelin proteins, which are essential for the integrity of myelin sheaths of neurons. SAH is converted back to homocysteine from a, by a hydrolase, completing the cycle. There are some negative feedback mechanisms to try and prevent accumulation of methylfolate including inhibition of serine hydroxymethyltransferase by methylfolate, as well as inhibition of MTHFR by SAM. It's important to note that the only way to convert N5-methyl tetrahydrofolate back to tetrahydrofolate is via methyl B12. On the other hand, there is another mechanism to convert homocysteine to methionine and it involves another essential nutrient, which is choline. Choline, as you might remember, features a nitrogen with three methyl groups attached to it, giving a formal charge to the nitrogen of plus one. This can be converted to a similar molecule known as betaine, which is also known as trimethylglycine. Betaine can donate one of those methyl groups to remethylate homocysteine back to methionine, which gives dimethylglycine. Dimethylglycine has its last two methyl groups stripped off, giving methylglycine or sarcosine and then glycine. Glycine actually functions as a methyl recipient in the case of excessive SAM, where it's converted back to sarcosine. This betaine pathway mostly takes place in the liver and importantly, does not take place in the central nervous system. 
that's methionine synthase, but I mentioned there was one more B12 dependent enzyme. You might recall this pathway as the catabolic pathway for homocysteine and methionine. Homocysteine is combined with serine, then gives off a cysteine and is converted combining with coenzyme A to give propanol CoA. This is a convergent point for the metabolism of odd chain fatty acids after beta oxidation, cholesterol side chains, as well as the amino acid isoleucine. Propanol CoA is carboxylated using biotin to D-methylmalonyl CoA, which is then converted to its stereoisomer L-methylmalonyl CoA, which is also an intermediate in valine metabolism. Now we're at the final step to join the citric acid cycle, the conversion of methanol, methylmalonyl CoA to succinyl CoA by methylmalonyl CoA mutase. This takes place in the mitochondria and uses adenosyl CoA, uh, adenosyl B12, sorry, as a cofactor, which shuttles, shuttles its cobalt between, uh, to the plus two oxidation state. So it's a completely different mechanism to methionine synthase. These are the t those are the only two enzymatic functions of B12 in the human body. So let's look at B12 deficiency now. This is often through malabsorption because it's such a complex molecule. For example, the autoimmune disease pernicious anemia, as well as other diseases of the gut or through acid suppression. It can also be through decreased intake. For example, vegans do not have a natural source of B12 and need to take it through supplements or fortified foods. Finally, there's some genetic diseases of processing and one particular drug reaction that we'll discuss later. Biochemically, we're going to see an increase in the substrates methylmalonyl-CoA, homocysteine, and N5-methyltetrahydrofolate, as well as a decrease in the products methionine and SAM. We'll also see depletion of mitochondrial coenzyme A, as it's all stuck in the propanol-CoA pathway, as well as depletion of tetrahydrofolate, which is stuck in its N5-methyl form. This is known as the methyl trap hypothesis, and causes a functional folate deficiency and an identical me megaloblastic anemia to that seen in folate deficiency. The difference with B12 is that we'll also get a more pronounced disruption of methionine homeostasis and in particular a range of neurological symptoms from lack of methylation of the myelin proteins. These range from reversible paresthesias to polyneuropathy, degeneration of the spinal cord, leukoencephalopathy, and in some cases, death. So there's one other important cause of B12 deficiency in critical care, and it relates to oxidation states. So the cobalt in methyl B12 in methionine synthase converts between plus three at rest to plus one without its methyl group when it's active. And every around one in 2000 cycles, it, this unstable plus one might oxidize spontaneously the plus two, which is inactive. The methionine synth synthase complex has an enzyme to reduce it back, which is methionine synthase reductase, which uses SAM as a methyl donor. So we can add that one to the list. Our drug villain here is the gaseous anesthetic nitrous oxide. Nitrous oxide can also oxidize the methyl B12 in methionine synthase to plus two, although it does it faster than the reductase can repair it. And then it can irreversibly oxidize it further to plus three. This causes dissociation from methionine synthase and deactivates the enzyme. The half time for inactivation is about 45 minutes with methionine synthase activity approaching zero after three to four hours and taking weeks to recover. This can be seen with frequent recreational nitrous oxide abuse or prolonged nitrous oxide anesthesia and usually causes delayed onset neurological symptoms. There have been severe anesthesia related outcomes and at least one death in a child with an underlying inborn error of folate metabolism. Nitrous oxide does not directly affect B12 in methylmalonyl-CoA mutase 
but it may have some long-term indirect effects. An important pitfall with B12 deficiency is treating it with folate alone, which might mask the megaloblastic anemia but will not prevent neurological damage. Folate deficiency is significantly less common than B12 as there are not as many issues with malabsorption and many foods contain or are fortified with folic acid. Like with B12, a dramatic form of folic acid deficiency can be therapeutically induced with drugs, in this case methotrexate. Methotrexate was engineered as a chemotherapy drug after a disastrous attempt to treat childhood leukemia with folic acid. Rapidly dividing cells need lots of DNA, so this was like pouring fuel on a fire. As you can see, its chemical structure is extremely similar to folic acid, and it acts as a competitive inhibitor of dihydrofolate reductase with approximately a thousand times higher affinity than folate. This has two major effects on folate homeostasis. It effectively prevents any new folate from being activated to tetrahydrofolate. It also means that folate used by thymidylate synthase cannot be recycled, which causes a significant functional folate deficiency. Methotrexate is the best illustration of why we need folate. It's usually, usually given as a weekly dose, but there have been many tragic cases where the weekly dose is accidentally taken daily. Administration in end-stage renal failure will cause the same effect. In these overdose cases, methotrexate is horrifically toxic with effects resembling acute radiation sickness, pancytopenia, GI upset, hepatitis, multi-organ failure, and death. So how does it work when you only want it in your system a day a week? As mentioned, certain cells are much more sensitive to folate deficiency, such as cancer cells. So exposure to, for only a brief period can be effective. To abroad, avoid broader systemic toxicity, folic acid is given often the following day or on all non-methotrexate days. But what if there's still methotrexate hanging around, like with high dose methotrexate or toxicity situations, because we know that the folic acid given as a supplement won't be activated. We do have a treatment for that, which is folinate or folinic acid. This is also known as leucovorin. If you look closely, it looks a lot more like tetrahydrofolate than folate, and it functions as an activated tetrahydrofolate, so it can be used as an antidote or rescue. This is often given after high-dose methotrexate chemotherapy or with some benefit in overdose. Finally, I'll briefly mention one more drug, which is 5-fluorouracil also known as 5-FU. 5-fluorouracil is a slightly more targeted chemotherapy drug that only inhibits the thymidylate synthase reaction. It's a prodrug that mimics, mimics uracil and in, in, in irreversibly inhibits the enzyme, known as a suicide substrate. It kills cancer cells by depleting thymidine and causing DNA damage when uracil is incorporated instead. This was an extract from a longer upcoming video on essential nutrients, part of a series of videos on nutrition. Hopefully it should be up within one to two weeks. Please subscribe to stay informed of updates and thanks for watching.